Hey, Metaphysical Milkshake, it's me, Rain Wilson. And it is I, Reza Aslan. Hi, Rain. Hi, uh, wait, what's your name again? Reza, Reza, you've met me many, many times. We've been working together for multiple Reza, years. Reza, Reza, that's Persian, right? Yes, it is Persian. And, the, and Reza means what? Does it, mean, it means like king, right? Uh, no, it does not, actually, it does not mean king. It means um, uh, satisfactory, actually. So your name really is Satisfactory Aslan. It's it's more complicated than that. Reza is the Persian version of the Arabic word Ridda. And Ridda, uh, yeah, Ridda basically means uh, he who is satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> so that's me. Okay. I am uh, uh, satisfactory. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake, the show where we go deep, we get weird, and we search for the meaning of life along the way. Presented by Cast Media and Soul Pancake. So, you, Satisfactory Aslan, um, you ever uh, played football? You ever uh, uh, bullied someone and beat the crap out of them? Uh, you, you've seen me, right? Like, you, you've seen my yeah. physical form? You're like four foot 11. <laughs> Hold on now. First of all, I'm five foot eight, as my license uh, says, though. Probably more yeah. like five foot six. You and Tom Cruise are five foot eight. Honestly, I was probably like 97 pounds a night. No, I never bullied anyone. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't you because uh, this next episode, you conveniently couldn't be there. And so I interviewed my good friend, the artist, the rabble rouser, the author, the TV host, the larger than life personality, Mr. David Cho. David Cho? And he was bullied by a kid named Reza and the Persian Mafia at the Beverly Hills High School. But I just wanted to make sure it wasn't you. But um, It wasn't me. Anyway, I want to show you the episode that we recorded, Reza. I'd love to get your hold thoughts. Hold on, hold on. Um, Are we talking about the same David Cho the, the, with the, the, the guy with the show on FX called The Cho Show? Yes. The same show that the New York Post calls simultaneously weird and compelling and, yes, cathartic for all those concerned? Uh, yes, this is David Cho, the street artist, um, who, in exchange for painting a mural in Facebook, instead of taking the money, he took the stock option. And let's just say he came out ahead of the deal. Uh, world-renowned artist, David Cho. Now, honestly, he's a good friend of mine. I've known him for a long time. And he is one of, truly, one of the most creative people that I know. Creativity is just coming out of his pores. Um, he's always writing, painting, acting, um, role-playing. It, it's, it's a constant, um, it's a cornucopia of imagination and creativity. And so I thought, who better to explore one of the concepts that we've always been really intrigued with, and we've touched on it in some other episodes, like with Tig Notaro, um, about comedy, is like, does, is trauma necessary to be an artist? Does one need to be a narcissist to be an artist? Does one need to be a madman to be an artist? Oh, I love this topic. I can't wait to listen to this. I'm going to play it for you. Um, you will, uh, you and all the other Rezas are going to really enjoy some of these stories. And um, let's get uh, back together after you've taken a look. Right, let's hear this. Hi, I'm Rain Wilson. Um, even if you're lactose intolerant, your soul is not. Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake. You may know me from films as The Rocker, where I actually learned how to play drums, or uh, The Meg, where I actually trained with sharks for weeks before I did that, or um, you may have read my memoir, Bassoon King. And, but that's not what we're here today. Are we gonna for. start this interview at some point? Um, we have a brilliant <laughs> artist here today, a brilliant artist who um, suffers from ADHD, ADD, all these things. Um, he has a show. I mean, no, out. no, please do tell me more about your bio. We, we people really want to hear more about the other movies <laughs> and the stuff that you did. Yeah, that's I just fascinating, Dave. I just want, I just want to get the um, listen show. You're on my podcast. I asked you here today. Okay. okay. And uh, let me just tell the audience who you are. Okay. So I have David Show here today, and he is a brilliant artist, and he has a show out right now on FX called The Cho Show. And to make it even more confusing, he has a podcast also called The Cho Show, and he does a bunch of other things. He 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 likes he likes to mess around. He likes to have fun. Very creative person. 
Let's hear it for David Cho. And that was that was the greatest introduction I've ever had. Thanks. Today we're here because we want to discuss um, creativity. I mean, David is one of those people that brings uh, art to every creativity, to every part of his life. So um, I'll start. I'll go first. Um, you know, uh, weird parents plus weird name equals weird kid. So that's me, Rain. Um, I played instruments like the xylophone and the bassoon, and I played games of chance growing up that involved 20-sided die and, um, you know, choosing characters. And so uh, my, my mother abandoned right. me. Dungeons I, and Dragons is not a game of chance, Rain. There's, there's, when you roll a dice, you could... Uh, well, that's true. That's true. If you hit a 20, then, you know, you've killed a, an ogre with a single crossbow bolt. Right. And, and as you know, people spend a lot of time investing in their characters. And sometimes when their character dies, it's like a part of you dies. So there's a lot invested. I relate to that. Um, my mother abandoned me when uh, I was young and my dad took me to Nicaragua. So you can imagine what that was like for me. And even though I'm not Korean, I had a, or I still do have a large Korean shaped head. And, and so you can imagine what the kids made fun of me at school. And so there was a lot of trauma. There was a lot of neglect and abandonment. My dad, you know, my father was, he would write sci-fi stories and, and, and paint uh, Picasso-esque women with lopsided breasts Rain. and Rain. <laughs> why why am i here i'm just i'm trying to explain my side and then i'll give you you don't have to be this impatient you know um i'll i'll, I'll I'm, I'm trying to set you up i'm trying to give you a foundation to come in and so for me uh all that i don't know how you measure that neglect that that trauma that abandonment but i knew when i got to school when i finally took my first drama class that was the first time I felt seen. Someone laughed at my jokes. Someone gave me validation. They, they clapped when I acted. So that's where I funneled all my creativity into that. And I'm just wondering for you where your creativity comes from. Uh, okay. Now it's my turn. Um, thanks, Rain. Thanks for that yeah. introduction. Yeah. Uh, so I'm David Cho. I'm an artist. Um, I mean, it's hard to describe myself as an artist because there's so much more that I do than just art. I don't want to just be like a, you know, a paint jockey, just throwing paint up on a canvas. You know, I try and do more than that. And uh, hence the various iterations of the Cho Show, you know, on television, on FX and Hulu and uh, my podcast. Uh, I did a live show called the Cho Show that was an art installation, kind of interactive multimedia uh, event. Uh, just so it's just a little bit more about me. I'm Korean. Um, my parents are immigrants. I was immigrant. I was sent back to live in Korea when I was a kid because um, my family was so poor. Uh, my parents are born again Christians. So, you know, when you see those Korean buses going around with like Korean lettering and it says like Church of the Apostles of the Seventh Day, you know, and then with Korean lettering on the side, like that was my family. Like we would drive around in those vans through Koreatown and stuff like that. And, you know, I just, um, I think what you referenced, uh, Rain, is that, uh, is creativity and its connection to trauma. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know where I stand on that. I think there's a lot of really good artists that um, haven't had any trauma um, and, or seemingly, and uh, do really amazing work, you know. But for me, you know, I don't know if I was born in the in the in the suburbs and we were kind of well off, and my parents loved me and and respected me and 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 kind of listened to me and and took an interest in in who I was and didn't you know weren't always trying to shame me uh, and trying to save my soul and you know uh, you know make sure I wasn't involved in anything involving you know sex or drugs or or pornography or, you know, illicit materials such as comic books of which I took an interest in at a very early age. I was about eight years old. Uh, you know, who knows? I might've ended up, um, you know, I might've ended up really, uh, 
more milk toast, you know? I don't I don't know. I might be a True, true. Look. I might be a high school uh, art teacher or who knows. Maybe I just own a real estate business, you know, in 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 Van Nuys. I don't know. What? That might have that may have made it made your parents proud. Um they'd well, probably be more proud of me if I owned a real estate business than being a successful uh artist. Deeply shameful. From what I know of the Korean community, deeply shameful to say you want to pursue hey, a, I'm a, sorry, Rain. What do you know about the Korean community? I I, I mean I there, I think that's crossing I, I, a line. I don't I don't I don't think you know too much about my faith, but there is a it's Baha'i and there is actually a lot of Koreans that believe in Baha'i. So I actually know a lot of Koreans. There's I get, Korean Baha'is? There's Korean Baha'is and I get asked to speak at their picnics and 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 events all the time. So I actually know a lot about their culture. Um, Wait, you can't know about a culture because you have gave Baha'i talks at a Korean Baha'i picnic. Well, that's that's your opinion as a Korean. All right. And, uh, you know, when I first moved to L.A., I actually went to Koreatown. So I actually know a lot about Koreans. And I've tried kimchi before. And uh, oh, that, is, that is impressive. Look, uh, before we dive into this further, I just want to apologize because my co-host uh, Reza is not here today. Yeah, why isn't he here? I thought we were... Uh, this is Rain he and was. I ta- actually called him this morning, and he was he was researching you, and he was really excited to talk to you, and and actually called you to tell you that. And just what I picked up since we're talking about creativity and trauma is to dive a little deeper. Um, I heard uh, some hesitation in your voice when I said Reza's name, and you know Reza P P P M Marajende Khoshkesh Tokmasad. That's uh, Persian power, Persian mafia. Um, represent. You went to a school with lots of Persians. Yeah. And um, Beverly Hills High School. And yeah. And we well, lived in the slums of Beverly Hills, don't get me wrong. <laughs> We're mostly from Koreatown, but for a few years I was there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And lots of Reza's there. That's where I lost my virginity. That's actually, um, that's what I remember you telling me. And uh, a lot of Reza's, a very common name. And freshman year of high school the Reza that was the all-star quarterback of the varsity team. I didn't know Persians played football. Yeah. Um, the, pummeled you almost to an inch of your life. How do you know this you about just told me, me, David Cho? You, you just told me on the phone today. Wow. When I, so um, uh, two black eyes, internal bleeding, broken nose, um, absolute humiliation. Wow. Uh, one of the biggest traumas in your life in front of thousands of kids. Thousands? Thou- well, it's a humongous high school. Uh, and it was on the front lawn. And so when I told you that Rez is not feeling well and he's not going to make it today, I, 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 I felt some relief because mm. that word is very triggering for you. Yeah. Or that's what I picked up. So, yeah. Um, well, this has been part of my process is kind of learning about triggers. And, um, you know, I've talked about it before on a lot of different podcasts. It was on Joe Rogan rich role, you know, many, many others. And, uh, you know, I talked a lot about, you know, kind of getting sober and getting therapy and dealing with my, uh, sexual abuse that happened to me when I was younger and, uh, the trauma that I've undergone. So this is part of it. You know, these things, these real trauma, I believe what I've learned through the therapeutic process, trauma lives in your body, you know? And um, uh, so I hear the word Reza and literally like if a, if a doctor had, you know, a, a pulsometer on me, like my heart rate would go up a little bit. My blood pressure would go up a little bit mm-hmm. um, because that was so, it wasn't, and it wasn't the pain, mm. you know, it was the humiliation. It was mm. like, oh, you were the little Korean kid who got the shit beat out of you mm. by Reza, the quarterback. and. Um, you know, I never lived it down. I mean, it was years later, kids at, at Beverly Hills High School would be like, uh, oh, Reza, or they'd make a Persian joke or something like that. So, you know, this, I'm not saying that I'm racist against Persians. I'm just saying that there's a You're lot of- You're just racist against the name Reza. Yeah, I'm kind of racist against names. You know, someone earlier was saying that Tyler's editing, you mm-hmm. know, the uh, this episode. And, um, and I was like, I hate that name, Tyler. I immediately dislike Tyler. Mm-hmm. Um, I heard you say that. Because it just sounds like an entitled little millennial white kid. Ladies and gentlemen, 
of the Metaphysical Milkshakes, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or something that's preventing you from achieving your goals? Why, yes. As a matter of fact, Rain, there is. I've, uh, you know, lately I've been, I've been dealing with uh, some anxiety, this weird, weird anxiety that comes out of nowhere in the middle of the night. Uh, and uh, I think I probably need to start seeing someone about it. Why not try BetterHelp? Because BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating in under 48 hours. BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. That's right. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor, and you'll get a timely and thoughtful response. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if and when needed. It's also more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and there is also financial aid available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. So visit their website, read the testimonials that are posted daily, visit betterhelp.com slash milkshake, that's better H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're now recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So don't forget the special offer for Metaphysical Milkshake listeners. You can get 10% off your entire first month at betterhelp.com slash milkshake. Betterhelp.com slash milkshake. What was I talking about? And you know, there's, so I, this is, so, I'm, in, I'm in a process, hold on a second. I'm in a process, a multi-year process of untangling, unpacking these traumas and these triggers to try and figure out what makes me tick? Because for many, many years, these traumas owned me. The shame around the traumas owned me. They drove my behavior. I did a lot of stuff that I'm really not proud of. And so I'm trying to unpack all of that. So even this opportunity to just come up against the name Reza allows me to air that out and mm. say, I have resentment against this kid. This was humiliating. I, you know, Even right now, I feel really, I get, I can feel 15 year old David and what that felt like. A broken tooth, blood running down my face, laughter of the kids. And once again, I am told the story of you're a failure, you're a piece of shit, no one cares about you, you're contemptible, you're hated, you'll never fit in. And now, you know what? I get to feel those emotions. I get to, I get to go through this. I have the, the bounty, the luxury, the ability to go. I had a, a therapist who once told me the only way out is through. And so I get to go through and I get to find out what's on the other side, which is I am loved. I am accepted. I am not a failure. I love myself. I can be a part of groups. I will be accepted by people. And I can forgive Reza, the mm. quarterback, and Reza, the podcast host. Mm. I can forgive because I am enough. Guys, um, DJ, can you change this to a red background, please? Um, Cho, that was... I just want to tell you right now, I love you. Um, you. You came in hot a little bit today. Like, I don't know if it was the traffic. And I know, I know how much work you've put into yourself. I know how much therapy you've gone to. I know how much years, years of work. Still, when you sat down today, sounded so angry. And I'm, I'm really glad you got to uh, unpack a lot of that stuff. And I just wanted to tell you, 
to echo what you just said is you are enough. You, right. you, you are enough. You're worthy and you're enough. And, and um, you know, thank you for being so vulnerable. Thank you for sharing that with me. I, I really was feeling everything you were saying right now. And um, Thanks, it, it really um, echoed a lot of my story of how I felt growing up alienated, isolated, and how I, I how, and, and how that manifested in so, so many dysfunctional ways in my life and how being an artist and, and acting was such a, a, a relief and an escape from, from how I could funnel all these emotions that you just openly uh, shared with me, how I, I put that into my art. So thank you for that. Well, I never, thanks. Thank you, Rain. I never would have, you know, if this was five years ago and I'd had those emotions, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what I would have done with them. I would have taken them out. They would have come out, come out sideways in some way. Yeah, I've, I've heard old, uh, you know, Howard Stern and, and, yeah. and your own podcast that you used to do. And it yeah. was just, it sounded like a, a, a just someone that was in so much pain yeah. and didn't know how to deal with it. And a lot of that I can see when I see your paintings, but um, you're enough and I'm glad you're here. And thanks. And you don't have to like put on a dance and be entertaining. And, and you know, I, I, I just love you just as you are. You know what I want to do for you, Rain? Because I appreciate this so much. What's that? Um, my paintings sell for minimum two, three hundred thousand dollars all the way up into the millions. I don't really have them on the market, but I want to give you your choice of any one of my paintings. Wow. You can come into the warehouse wow. as a gift to you, mm. or you can sell it for your nonprofit. Oh my God. Are, are you, you can have are you serious your right pick of any one of my paintings. Mm. That's how much. When you don't care if I ever resell it or anything. This like, conversation. Well, I'd prefer you didn't resell it unless it was some kind of like charity auction. Wow. Uh, that's the only stipulation because oh God, there's so certain price uh, settings that has to do with the gallery art market bullshit world, which I'm just starting wow. to kind of figure out and get into. But oh my God, I I mean that's so generous. Thank you so much. I've, yeah. I've I never thought I would own a show and. I know you don't sell your art, so wow, Th Jesus, wow, yeah. thank you. Um, um, I'd like to accept. I would actually, I would love to accept because you're my friend and, mm -hmm. and your art means so much to me. Mm -hmm. But um, and this is my own work I need to do. Um, there's too much of your art that reminds me of my father's art, so I can't hang it in my house. So I'm gonna have to respectfully decline no i think you're gonna have to yeah you're gonna have to take one of those paintings <laughs> <laughs> nah, you just yeah you're gonna have to get over that so we can get some therapy together all right and I'll, we go, can... I'll go see i'll go see bruce and <laughs> and scene and scene and red 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 light hit that sh oh yellow, yellow okay. purple pink here we go. Wow, dude. Okay. And that's why he gets the big bucks, dude. Amazing. Um, um, we both kind of get the big bucks, although not in the <laughs> podcast world. <laughs> wow, that was so good, man. I was, that was fucking, I was like, your face, like your eyes started to turn Korean. And I like, even though you're wearing <laughs> sunglasses and don't really resemble me, like you, I thought I was looking at myself for a second. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we did not, I think, David had that up his sleeve. I had no idea that was going to happen. So we were. <laughs> How often am I, am I going to get to uh, role play and act with the great Rain Wilson? Well, so. anytime, anytime you want. <laughs> you know, when I pick up that painting, you, we can, I'll give you some, <laughs> <laughs> some acting lessons. Um, once again, welcome to Metal, Metaphysical Milkshake uh, Part 2. Uh, I'm Rain Wilson. With me is the great artist, David Cho. Um, you, you and I have been through a lot of therapy. Um, we went to a similar, through a similar kind of a, a program that was really intensive where there was a lot of like psychodrama, 
uh, et cetera, like that. And um, we've so we've talked about that in the past. It was a pleasure to kind of get to share mm-hmm. that a little bit. Maybe we can do a little bit more later on We'd love in to the play. show. I like to play. That's true creativity, right? Like you said, like I said earlier, you're one of the most creative people that I know. Like creativity is constantly vomiting out of you. It's like you're you're painting, you're drawing, you're singing, you're in a Korean punk band, <laughs> right? Um, you've done performance art, installation, theater. You've just made a TV show. Um, you're constantly uh, up to something creative. And uh, there's all these cliches about creativity. We talked about one of them, like creativity comes from trauma. Although I don't know if that's a cliche because it's, it's born true. true out of just thousands of cases. Um, but also art, with art comes madness, mm. the artist as madman. And then the artist and something that we've talked about a lot in our in our friendship over the last six years or seven years, however long it's been, um, uh, art artist as narcissist. I know narcissism is something that we deal with. So mm-hmm. what do you think? Artist as madman, artist as narcissist. Are those things necessary for creation? Let me shake Rain Wilson out of me. Okay. Um, I'm me again. Good. Hey, hey everyone. Um, I, there's a few things that are true, which is I am lactose intolerant. I did have diarrhea like moments right before this podcast. And I did have the absolute living shit kicked out of me in front of thousands of kids because it was like um, the story the whole day around the school was the varsity quarterback, Reza, is going to kick the shit or is going to fight the weird Dave Cho where rumor was going around that I had ninja skills. So it was going to be like the strong. Oh, so jerk. there's racism thrown in as well. Yeah. I mean, I mean that's I, anti-Asian racism. Yeah, right it there. was like, it, it was like the Karate Kid. Those movies were out and they were like, he's weird. He keeps to himself. And we heard that he knows some kind of like metaphysical, like, uh, you know, martial arts skills. So it was a, it was a big buildup. And, and, um, and so you want to talk about, well, I just did your buddy Rich Rolls podcast about a month ago. And uh, um, the question was, does, do you need to suffer to, to create great art? And it's, it's like one of these questions that's always asked. And the answer is just yes. It's just yes. And so if you're listening right now, if you're watching right now, you're mentally ill because only mentally ill people listen to podcasts and you're sick. And if, if you're talking about suffering and trauma, We've had it. No one has had a perfect childhood. No one, that's what I've learned is we, we, we try to put trauma on, on as a competition. Like, oh, this person had the worst childhood. This person just didn't get the presents he wanted for his birthday. But all those things are, as our friend Kevin likes to say, maximum to them. And so at, no one had a perfect childhood. Everyone's been traumatized in their own way. So does it, does it take trauma to create something? Yes. But the, the thing is, You've already had it, right? Like I'm, I, I, I got stuck in a cycle where I'm like, I got the living shit kicked out of me by this guy Reza and I hated, you, you hit it on the mark. I hated how that made me feel. Mm-hmm. The black eyes healed, the nose healed, the, the pain, it, it, it sucked and then it went away. The, the shame, the humiliation lasted forever. And from that, I will never ever make another human being make me feel like that again ever. And how, how do I do that? Do I go to the gym? Do I learn actual ninja skills? Do I, no, I'm not going to do that. But where do, where can I shine? When I draw, when I draw, girls notice me, my parents notice me, everyone notices yeah. me. So yeah. if I can draw even better, then people like Reza will never fuck with me. Or, and, and what, what are the things that I can, can accomplish by being a great artist. I can make money, I can get fame. And, I, and once I'm an important enough VIP, important person, then people like that won't fuck with me. They won't, you know. So that's the energy that that absolutely created. And then, it, the, and then the girlfriend, you were dating the hottest girl at Beverly Hills High School and then she dumped you. <laughs> she dumped me. And, and, I, and, and then she left you for not Reza, but another football player, right? Um, 
and, and actually another Persian football player. But she no. left you for another Persian yeah. football. Yeah. I didn't know that there was this union of Persian football players. There was a players. lot of Persians. At, the Persian um, PM, Persian Mafia, PP, Persian Power. And I actually love Persian food. I love Persian people, you know. Japanese uh, food, my number one favorite. Number two, Persian food. Uh, it's so good and it's, it's little appreciated. The kebab, the, all the dishes, the stews, it's amazing. I, I, I'll just, I just lied right now, so I'll back up because I just want to correct that. I fucking hated Persian people, right? Like You did? You, yeah, you just nailed it. Got the living shit kicked out of me in high school. Then my... Girl, my first girlfriend that I was completely in love with left me for a Persian. So, of course, I hated Persians. I hated their culture. I hated everything about them. I don't today. Currently, I love them. I love Persians. I love everything about the culture. But I did. That's true. That's a true statement. I did hate Persian people. Mm -hmm. I don't anymore. It's not even a debate. It's not even a question. If that didn't happen, would I still be an artist? Yes, but it wouldn't have the level of intensity and creativity of what can I do? I, I feel so lost right now. I feel so hurt. I feel so, so much pain. Right now on this podcast? Yes. And back then, I'm tapping into it. But at that time, you know, heartbroken. The heartbroken. worst pain you could feel. Shit beat out of you. Nose broken. Mocked. 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 And so the- And only, the racist stuff. And the racist you've shit. you talked about Everything. A lot. Yeah. Shame, humiliation, like everything. I don't know what to do with this level of pain. Uh, you know, I didn't do it, but, you know, suicidal thoughts as a, you know, very emo high school kid. And so I poured it into my paintings and my drawings on a level that I never would have if those things didn't happen. Yeah. But those, so, so then I'm 45 now and I'm talking about things that happened 30 years ago, three decades ago, and I could let them go. I can have this conversation with you, yeah. but I didn't. I didn't five years ago, six, seven years ago, seven yeah. years ago, I didn't. Well, I would keep repeating the trauma. So the question comes, does great art require suffering? And the answer is yes, but you've already suffered. If you're watching this right now, you've suffered. You have, you, you already went through the breakup. You already had the shitty parents. You already had all the fucked up shit that happened to you. You, you don't have to keep, I'll use I statements. I don't have to keep repeating those yeah. things. But I did. I would be stuck. I was stuck being the keyword on a fucking treadmill of trauma where I just kept repeating this shit over and over again. Because yeah. I was like, that's my pattern. Yeah. I get fucked with, I get hurt, and then I'm going to use that as gasoline. So for where, does, my... where do your parents fit into that? Oh, I mean, they, they are the most loving, wonderful people and monsters at the same time. <laughs> like, it's true. I mean, I love my mom. I'll fucking die for her. I'll do anything for her. And she's a fucking bitch. It's both things. And, you know, I, I, I get to, um, I'm very brave when I talk about her that way because I know she doesn't listen to Metaphysical Milkshake. <laughs> and if she was listening right now, I would never say that. Um, I just, but yeah, my, that was like my father. My father, anyone who knows my dad, he's like a, he's like a funny, goofy. Your parents are sweethearts. Yeah. They're like adorable. You just want to hug them. But one day, my dad, beat the living shit out of me. Holy fuck, this is so crazy right now. I swear to God, this was not planned. My dad beat the shit out of me because I had holes in my jeans. And if you remember the 90s or the late 80s, that was cool, right? right. People would do that on purpose. They would buy jeans. But you and, came from a poor family. Right. Holes in pants meant and I, peasant. Exactly. I don't know what, you know, and this is me trying to like, you know, figure out my, you know, what my dad's day was I don't know what his day was like. I don't know what it's like to not speak English perfectly and try to raise three boys in America. So he came home one day and saw me ripping brand new jeans that, you know, I don't know, like that's a lot of money for him. And he beat the living shit out of me. He said, we're going to go out tonight and you're not wearing that, you know, change and, or, or where the, and, you know, my mom, the thing that kept happening is I kept ripping these holes in the jeans and my mom kept patching them up with, with patches, like fl flower <laughs> patches and, and rainbow bright patches. Yeah. And I'm like, do you, and to them, it's like, wow. it's a hole that needs to be fixed. Yeah. To me, it's like, let this hole fucking gape me, open this shit up, you know? And so I, you know, I was a rebellious teenager. I was like, no, this dad, you're fucking, you're a gook from Korea. You don't know, you don't know what's cool right now. 
He's like, no son of mine is leaving the house looking like a peasant. And so I said, you know, I, I didn't say fuck you, but I pretty much said, no, I'm, I'm, and I started walking out the door and he picked me up and he threw me across the room and he just started punching me, which, um, you know, like he spanked me and shit. And like, we got like that type of typical Korean uh, abuse growing up, which, you know, once also I could be like, oh, that's just part of our culture, you know, but he never like punched me. He never like fist fighted me, you know? And so he's like punching me and like, he just kind of, his face changed to a different person. And, um, you know, the, the reason why I brought it up is like, I'm, I'm wearing pants like covered in, you know, these pants cost 900 bucks, but they look like peasant pants, but they're like made. Those pants cost $900. Yeah. They're like for real. Yeah. For real. They're like vintage. I feel like beating the shit out of you right now for wearing $900 pants. Hey guys, change the lights to (laughs) strobe lights and I'm going to beat the shit out of rain right now. Um, (laughs) No, but that informed my style, right? That trauma informs like me wearing clothes that are like ridiculously expensive, but still look like I'm homeless, right? My brain goes, my dad was 99.9% awesome. And one time he kicked my ass. So let's just forget about that part. And anytime a therapist try to bring it up or anyone try to bring it up, I'd be like, why are you trying to turn my dad into like a bad guy? He's not, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's not about my dad being a bad guy. It's just about just accepting that that did happen and not hiding from it and addressing it and then moving on from it. And uh, I've done that now. I've been in rooms where people have played my dad where I've played my dad. And so I've worked through it because I, you know, the Korean way to apologize, because I know he's sorry, but the typical Asian ways to never say sorry, but to like make you dinner or something like do like some kind of action to show, hey, I love you and I'm sorry, but I'm literally never going to say the words that I'm sorry. So. Well, I relate so much to your story. Um, I, I'm a pretty good actor. I don't consider my, in all honesty, I don't consider myself anywhere near your level of like, brilliance. I think I'm a good character actor, but that's something that's worth something, but it was the exact same thing for me. I had never felt like I fit in. I always felt I had the shit beat out of me in junior high school several times. Um, I always felt lift left out. I felt alienated uh, at home. My parents were in a loveless marriage. They were very odd human beings. Um, a lot of kind of emotional developmental issues and whatnot. And when I moved to this new high school and I took my first acting class, all of a sudden I found out I was really good at it and I was brand new. I made people laugh and all the girls came over and were like, I might've told this story before. I apologize if I have, if if I've heard it before on this and all these cute young women came over and were like, who are you? What's your name? You're so funny. Will you sit at our lunch table? And they were putting their hand, I'll never forget like just the feeling of like their hands on my shoulder like oh and i and i was like getting these like literally physical strokes for like an attention and then i started dating some of them i dated two or three of the of the attractive ones and at my old high school you know girls really didn't want anything to do with me and then so all of a sudden i was just like screw all the nerd crap i'm going into acting Mm. and I threw myself in the same way you threw yourself into drawing. Maybe there wasn't quite as much anger behind it, but it was kind of like, I am never going to feel that way again. I'm never going to feel left out again. I think there was just as much anger. You're one of the angriest dudes I know. (laughs) I'm never going to feel like belittled again or looked down upon again or, or the weirdo again, or Mm. if I am the weirdo, I'll be embraced for being the weirdo. And guess what? I am embraced for being the weirdo because I'm naturally offbeat. And then I got to play characters, including Dwight, that are offbeat. And so, so here we are. So there is, there is that fuel. You know, I told you a little bit earlier, you are enough when I, you were me. So I was yeah. basically saying, um, you are enough to myself, mm-hmm. but you're enough. I still battle with that. No, but you really are. And you are brilliant. And I, I, I believe that. I believe that about you. I've seen you. I've seen your brilliance and your heart and what you do. I did do a pretty fucking brilliant David Cho earlier. That was pretty good, man. Yeah, I mean, I I relate to all of that. You know, I remember the first contact wasn't even a hand. It was like 
I was drawing something and it was just like, I, I was, I was so shy back then I would never show it to him, but I was drawing it like really small in my sketchbook and a girl saw like the level of detail and she came in close and her hair like touched my shoulder and I was like, holy fuck, like this girl that is really attractive is getting close to me because she wants to see what I'm doing. And I was like, this is, this is the business I need to go in. Yeah, this, this is, is it. it. <laughs> yeah, this it was it. the same with me. Just leave it, leave it behind. But there's something else I want to talk to you about. Um, <clears throat> And then we can uh, talk more about your mother. <laughs> but um, Fuck you. Uh, I have two things I want to say. You've been getting a lot of therapy, recovery. You're a different person today. You're in a long-term relationship. You have a kid. You're... Um, best part, best, like the happiest I've ever been in my life. Happiest I've ever been. Yeah. By the way, you're looking really svelte and, and fit right now. Thank you. Um, and... Are you, but you're making less art and do you feel less creative? Do you feel like if, you know, New York City said, hey, we want you to do a mural in the middle of Times Square, like, could you go kick ass? Could you, you know, can you, can you find, can you tap into that creative vein? So being balanced part, in your life right now? Part of, um, one of the programs in GA, Gamblers Anonymous program, because I'm a, s a severe gambling addict. And one of the things that I learned as a gambler is you got to get out while you're ahead, right? And so um, there's a- there's They a, teach that at Gamblers Anonymous? I don't know that they teach I don't that think at they, Gamblers they don't Anonymous. They teach that, but that's like, what- Like, hi, I've just mortgaged my home. And, <laughs> no, no, no. And my wife has kicked me out of the house like- Hey, they, buddy, you got to get out where you're at. They don't teach you. You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the pamphlets. They don't teach you that. <laughs> but the, I learned that as a gambler and I try to apply that to all. There's something, I'm 45 years old and uh, no disrespect to the old school heads out there, but there's something sad to me about a 45 year old graffiti artist. So I, could I do a giant mural in New York Times? I, I First of all, I care about my health. I want to live long. Uh, spray painting, doing murals is some of the most toxic paint in the, you know, like I have smoker's lungs and I've never smoked a cigarette in my life mm -hmm. just from the aerosol. And I, I paint mostly in- You might as well start smoking. I mean, might as you well. got the lungs for it. So I paint mostly in watercolors. And, um, you know, you, when you were doing this brilliant job playing me earlier, you, you know, you got a few details wrong, but you had tapped directly into- I, I felt you, man. I was, I was there. I was feeling it all again. So with me being at the best, like in my opinion, the best I've ever felt, I'm the happiest I've ever been. The, the, this is the best part of my life right now. There is a narrative that just screams. So your art must be shitty then because you don't got that thing. You don't mm. got that mm, to like, you have no part of you that needs to prove your, cause you know why? Cause you're enough. You don't need to show off. You don't need to do the every fucking hair on that portrait. You could just pfft, and abstract it in, you know, like, so that, that, that's a narrative. But the truth is like I was saying, does, you know, great art require suffering? I've already suffered. You've already suffered. So just like the way you did right there, I can tap into it. You, get it. you can get into it. I can tap oh, into it great. at any time. I don't have that's to be angry. That's a great answer. I could just tap into it. And, and you know, I just talked to Steve-O on his podcast and, I, and I've had a similar question where, where you guys almost get offended where, when I go, have you ever done a great, you know, in Steve-O's case, a stunt or acted or, or in my case, a painting where it was just for you? where it wasn't for an audience, where it wasn't need to be validated. I by. struggle with that. And, and the answer is like, in Steve-O's case, he was almost like, fuck you. Like, why would you even ask me that? Of course, it's, does, it's like it didn't even happen if no one saw it. And I'm, if I'm really, and, and the thing is, if you see me on a hike, I hike a lot, I'm literally saying out loud, I'm enough while I'm hiking. That's like kind of like, I'm like, I'm enough, I'm enough. And, and, and then I start to really believe it because the first time I said it or the first time you said it to me or someone else said it to me, I didn't believe it and I still struggle with it. But if it is true that it's enough, then it is actually the most creative time in my life because I have thousands of drawings, thousands that no one's ever seen. And I do them just for, with, my, with my baby and 
like, like if I'm playing with her, I go, okay, I could just dial it in right now, read her a book, do, you know, just do normal dad shit, or I can just create a fucking insane magical world for right now, audience of one, right? But that takes time. It's going to take hours. I'm going to have to make this costume. And it's like, oh, I should film it. Or, you know, I should, you know, my brain goes into like, my mom, Jane Cho marketing, like, oh, then I should make a children's book and monetize it, you know? And I go, I can't, I gotta get over myself and go, this is something that's just for me and my family. Ah, oh, fuck, but it's, people should see it and it's gonna get so many views and it can make money. And, but in my, in my opinion, it's the most creative I've been it's just, it's not for an audience. It's not for everybody. But I, w I would, couldn't one argue like, if you're Yo-Yo Ma and you're the most brilliant cellist and creating, and you're creating a symphony in your closet. Right. And you're creating the most beautiful music you've ever created in your life. And you're like, and you're creating all this incredible music. Don't you also have an obligation to share that beauty with someone whose heart might be touched by it and it might affect their life and change them in some way? You're enough. You are enough. This is the, what you just said right now is what I also struggle with is when you say that, my ego, my narcissism goes, absolutely, dude. So I should spend more time trying to get it out to the people. And that's why I struggle with how much TV. But don't you, what not, isn't what you, what you struggle with, what we struggle with, balance? So you're doing this art. There is for no your balance. Child. There is no balance. That is, in my opinion, there is no balance. People go, oh, you know, they hear your problems, they hear about life, and they go, hey, you know what you need in your life? You need to just balance, like, you know, have a few vegan meals, and you know, you can eat one cheat meal. You know, the people that I hang out with, or I, I, I'll say I statements again. I've never had balance. When I'm in, I'm in. And it's something I've tried. I've taken classes. I've read books of like, how do I balance? It's like, and maybe I'm not there yet, or maybe I haven't ha met the person that can do it properly yet. Like, yeah, but you like you talking like about veganism. Before. You you went all in on veganism because really. you got a bad report from your doctor, so you went vegan for several months, and then you gave up on veganism, and then you were just eating cheeseburgers for months. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> There's no balance, right? And so you have people that touch people's lives, like, and and I, I've never met Gabor Mate, but I know you talk to him, like a guy like that who's just full of empathy and wisdom, and he can touch and change people's lives. And you're like, oh, like, but is he healthy? I mean, he looks really skinny. And this is me jumping to assumptions and judging, but some of these people, um, and that's my, like I said, that's my own narcissism. And I, I sit there and I've played, you know, like I said, it's, it's been an explosion of creativity the last five, six years. So I have movies no one's ever seen. I have TV shows no one's ever seen. I have books no one's seen. I have hundreds of podcasts no one's ever heard. And when I play it, you first, have a, you have a autobiography that no one's read. I have a book that's you know I have things, and I go, my ego and my narcissism says people need to to see this because it will change lives. Because I've done other art where I get fan mail and people go, this changed my life, this changed my life, and I go, what about me right now? Is it selfish? Is it narcissistic to be like I don't want to go into marketing, branding, promo mode right now? I just want to like I did the work. One day it'll be out in the world. One day, maybe when I'm more, or, or, or maybe I'll just put it out when I die. Or uh, wh what about just me getting healthy and spending time with my family? And that's what I'm doing well, right no now. One, no one can deny you that. But I would say, and I want to lead to the next question, and then we can uh, uh, go to the next section. Um, and that is, um, you know, let's say there's a, some kind of great creative force, spirit, cosmic spirit in the universe. Mm -hmm. And this great creative force wants us to be less self-involved and more giving to others. So less selfish, less me oriented, which is kind of the modern disease. It's me, 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 mm -hmm. me. But, you know, like on the airplane, they, you know, you have to put the 
oxygen mask on your own face first before you put the oxygen mask on someone else, that frequently used analogy. Mm -hmm. So you have to get better so that you can serve others. But then the goal would be to use your art to make, to enrich other people's lives. So it's not about you. It's about, it's about others. Not a, and even, but it's not narcissism either because it's not about the glory. It's not about the fame. Like how does this reflect on me? It's got to be given in that pure spirit of giving. And you said, and part two of that is you had a quote, creativity is God. When I am creating, that's me praying. And that is very similar um, to a quote from the Baha'i faith, which is that art is the same as prayer. That one, when one puts the paintbrush to the paper, it is, is, it is the same thing as kneeling in the temple. This is a, a art, central so, quote from the Baha'i faith. So, so are there Korean Baha'i? There's, I'm, I've, I know a couple of Korean maybe I'll, the, maybe I'll be the first one. Um, I like that quote. Um, I'll say- so, so those are the two things. Like pre, let's presuppose the existence of some kind of higher power. That higher power wants us to give back. And also is art divine? Is that where you find your connection to the higher power in the, in the act of it itself? Is there a sacredness there, a divinity? Absolutely. To me, a art- A transcendence? Absolutely. Uh, to me, art can transcend it, and it is definitely sacred. Um, but to, um, I'll plug my own show right now. I have a show on Hulu right now called The Cho Show. And um, I believe that is the act of me being creative and giving back. And it's only four episodes, which actually it isn't. It's you know, I've interviewed uh, over a thousand people in the last seven years. So there's way more than four episodes. But because shame is such a powerful drug in our, in our culture and people use it in different ways. Some people run to it. Some people run away from it. Um, people that I interview, they opened up, they shared their, yeah. their souls and immediately regretted it. And they said, I can't have this out. I can't have the world see this. Yeah, you had a number of people who recorded with you, right. signed releases. Thank you for not being one of the spent people that pulled hours them. in front of cameras, bared yes. their souls, and then were like, oh, fuck no. Yeah. So um, so there's a, a bit of, and, and the reason, and the thing is, I do it so openly all the time, and I'm so used to it that I don't think about it. And, you know, I, I can, I, I've spent enough time with these issues where I can talk openly about my sexual abuse, uh, all the abuses, the spiritual abuse, the religious abuse, and all these things that happened to me um, in a way where I can talk about it and I, and I get strength from it. But a lot of people still don't, they, they, they don't want to wear it. They don't want to talk about it. They, you know, so, so I get it. So when I put a show out like that, there's a part of me that says, am I actually helping people? Because the actual people that I thought I was helping on the show that I interviewed, they're saying the show is hurting them. And can you please not put it out? So, but you're helping that audience that's seen the show. People love the show. Right. So they the, write to you. They talk about this was, I needed to hear this. Well, Here's that goes back to the narcissism and like kind of the martyrdom. And it's like, I'm going to sacrifice myself and like the, the way people uh, see me and all, all the guests on my show so that it can help all these people. And there's something that I'm still trying to figure out about that, uh, about, you know, basically going to all your last questions of the creativity is done. The show's done, right? Like it took me more work to get the show on TV than to actually make the show. And the show, you know, it has like over 40,000 hand-drawn animation. Like it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And, and yet it was more work to get it on TV and we live in a weird culture right now where, you know, I'll hang out with you. I'll hang out with other creative people and it, it will be present with each other. I'm with you. I mean, I, I get that we're recording this right now, but, you know, outside of this, we'll be together and something amazing, someone will do something funny or someone will sing a song. And that feeling of someone's being creative right now. Someone's talking to God right now. Can it just be that? Or do we have to put it up on social media? And that's the fight. It's like, man, something amazing is happening right now. I got to share it with the world because I'm enjoying it. So everyone else should enjoy it. And, and I struggle with that. And, you know, part of that now is I have a child safe phone and, and I block myself from that. So I, I'm, 
saying about the balance earlier, it hasn't existed for me yet, but I'm still working on it. And for me, who is from a family with tons of uh, religious abuse and spiritual abuse, I'd never heard those terms before. I'd only heard sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal, mental abuse. Sure. And I and I grew up in a family that like that. I mm -hmm. was I, I thought sometimes I was Satan. I slumped, sometimes I thought I was going to burn in hell. And it's 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 um it's insane when we go to like the treatment centers that. Did your been. family tell you that you were going to burn in hell? Yeah, I mean that's very clear in the Christian religion. If you do not accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you will go. But to hell. did your mom tell you that? Uh, yes, yes, in a very nice way. But that was still the message. I remember Joey, who was Jewish, my best friend growing up, coming over, and um, and you know, I'd, I'd like to, you know, put my mom on the spot so she'd be cooking dinner for us. And I'm like, Mom, Joey's Jewish. Is he gonna burn in hell? And she's like, Absolutely. You want some? You want some kimchi chige with that? Like, she, you know, she's just that person. So she would deliver the message, you know, with a little song and dance. But it was still, yeah, you're gonna smell the brimstone like it's happening. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with these kinds of things, and then I end up in like these treatment centers in my mind, I judge before I get there. I'm like, man, there's gonna be some really fucked up people there, like suicidal drug addicts. And I get there and all those people are there. And you hear their stories of sexual abuse, physical abuse. Mm. And at the end, and you know, I keep saying trauma is not, not a competition, but then I'm like, why is there so many Hasidic Jews here? Why is there so many Mormons here? Why is there so many, you know, Cat, you know, like strict religious, and and you're like, wait, at the at the at the bottom of all this abuse is like this religious abuse. So for someone like me who has all this negative connotations with religion and spirituality, it's very hard to pray. It's very hard to like get in touch with the higher powers and and mm -hmm. you know, I, I I think I'm spiritual, and then like I'll try to meditate, and just my mind starts thinking about. Yeah, pornographic images or something. I can't clear my I mind. I remember um, the late great director Roger Michelle. He just passed away. I got to work with him. He's a terrific uh, film director. Um, we were touring this church in England, and he said, "Oh, so you're a Baha'i?" I was like, "Yeah." What do you, What do you? He's like, "You believe in God?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he goes, "I said, what about you?" And he's like, "Oh no, I could never believe in God. You know, um, when I was a kid, I was." dragged to church every day. I had to be a choir boy. I had to, you know, practice this and that. I had to be in the church choir and, oh, oh God. So I could never believe in God. Mm. And so he had fused these two. Mm. He, this brilliant, yeah. well-read, brilliant guy yeah. in those sentences couldn't disassemble. Right. I had religious abuse thrown at me growing up. And do I believe in God? Some that of those... And those get welded. And I, and I understand why. I Some get of it. the smartest, most brilliant people I've ever met are the dumbest people I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I, it takes like a team of people for me to keep coming back to get me to figure out like, oh man, this is, I'm bringing a lot of baggage to this thing. And one day I was just going for a walk and I was like, man, I'm having a real hard time. Like, I feel like I'm a spiritual person, but I just can't get there. And it's just, I'm like, man, I live in a city and the humans is like all these people, they're just sad and they have addictions and they have mental illness and, and they just can't figure their shit out and this and that. And we just live in this godless world and fucking porn every, you know, and internet. And so, you know, it's just like, it feels so heavy. And, and through all of that, I go, that act of getting on your hands and knees and putting your hands together it's tough for me, but I'm like, what, when I, when I see this person who can't sing, but like really try to sing or someone who designed the, an amazing building with flying buttresses or someone who, who, who from the depth of their soul can belt out. I'm like, oh, that's praying. Like w w us, these sad humans that live in this fucking horrible time in the world with all this crazy shit happening. What, what like what stops that, right? What crosses and transcends all barriers, races is like when fuck you, fuck you. And then someone like can sing amazing or someone can like yeah. creatively bring a new energy to a sport or design a new car or, you know, just I'm like, holy shit. Like you feel like, what are you, tra you're transcending everything because you're 
you're literally talking to God at that moment. I, and, and that's what I feel like. And people call it different things like flow state or it's like when you have all this noise and shit, but you're like, wait, for this second, I'm going to try to write a song and sing it even though I can't sing. Or I'm going to, oh, I've had this idea in my head. It's, where, where is that coming from? And for me, I'm like, oh, that's what prayer is. That's what makes sense to me. And, and in that way, I love God. And, and I worship God because that's what I do. I draw, I create, and I try to br bring creativity to every part of my life. So that means I'm praying all the time. David Cho, this has been an absolute honor. But before we end the show, <laughs> um, we have one more segment that we need to do. So this is Rain Wilson. We've had the brilliant and very Korean David Cho here today. Wow, thank you for sharing all that. That was that was a lot, you know. Uh, I, I think our, our listeners will really appreciate you. I could keep going for another three hours. I, I know, and I know that me cutting we could, you We off, could get all Rogan on this. I know, me trying to cut you off right now, I can sense that you're you're feeling like you're being rejected, but I, I loved it. Um, I am enough. Tyler, can, you're, you are enough. Tyler, can you please cut at least 40%, uh, 50% of what he's, everything he said today? Uh, Rain, um, I, I'm Rain, and... Um, the I'm way, David. The way we like to end the last sip of metaphysical milkshake is <sighs> lightning round. And you guys know what this is. So, David, I uh, hope you're ready. Uh, I'm going to okay. shoot you. I'll see what happens. Yeah, okay. just, just, just first thing that comes to your mind, okay? <laughs> first thing, okay. When do you feel the most connected with the universe? Um, in nature. You know, if I'm able to hear birds sing, I feel like I'm part of something bigger than myself. Wh um, what skill do you wish you had? Um, I wish I could build things, you know, I wish I could fix things. I wish that like, there's a, a leak under the sink. I wish that I could just like grab a tool box and like, you know, fix it and stuff like that. Like I'm good with paint brushes. I can build a canvas, you know, I can create sculpture, but why can't I like fix a door hinge? Uh, what is the happiest, what was the happiest day of your life? Uh, the birth of my child. Wow. Um, how come you're the best? I am not the best. I am. Enough. How come you're the best? You are enough. You are the best. Now answer. How come you're the best? I, I reject that question. That fuels my narcissism. We've talked about that. I am a humble worker among workers. What is your greatest wish or desire? Oh, uh, a world peace B to find, uh, uh, to continue to find uh, happiness, joy, and serenity in the in my making of art, I'm wondering what my next chapter is going to be. What why what one eye opening experience should every person have? Um, I was in a Japanese prison um, for shoplifting, and that was one of the times I really hit bottom. It was very, very dark. And I won't say that I wish that on everyone to be in a Japanese prison. We think, oh, Japanese, they're so polite and they're nice and wonderful prepared sushis and, you know, beautiful downtown. Like, oh, their prisons have got to be nice. The worst, the worst. Um, it scarred me and yet it gave me a perspective that I'm really grateful for. So you described like a kind of purgatory, which brings us to our ne next question. What happens to us when we die? Our, uh, our consciousness uh, detaches from this meat suit that we're riding around in for 90 plus years. And- You're it, an artist. I, I'm sure you have a very visual description in your head of what uh -huh. nirvana, heaven, yeah. afterlife looks like. Right, well, we know, picture all of the greatest colors you've ever seen in your life and the greatest music, your very favorite music, symphony, Radiohead, whatever it is, that's happening and the most beautiful aromas you can ever picture. And then, and then know that whatever is in the next plane of existence for our consciousnesses, there's at least seven other layers of perception beyond what I just described. So creep on repeat with like the smell of not creep fresh no. uh, comic books. No, no, no. In rainbows. What one tip can you, can you give parents that would help their children's happiness? Uh, listen to them. And last question, is everything going to be okay? No. 
Wow, Dave, what a way to end the show. See, because I feel like if I was you, Rain would have said yes, but I'm David Cho, I would say no. You are David Cho, and that is a very David Cho answer. And a real David Cho answer would to be do the opposite of that. So it's yes. Rain, thanks for having me on your show. It's yes, everything's going to be okay, guys. Yes. Love you, brother. Love you, Rain. Love you, Cho. You're enough. You're enough. Whoa, uh, that was unlike any episode of Metaphysical Milkshake we've ever done. I have two immediate observations. I'm never letting you do this solo again. Okay. And now that I think about it, I do remember punching a, an Asian kid named David when I was, I'm just kidding. No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, David. I think he is kind of a better Rain Wilson than I am. <laughs> I, I'm not going to disagree with that. I think he could fill in for me and just pretend to be me and uh, we would not even skip a beat. Hey, maybe like me, him, and all those Facebook uh, stock options can uh, start doing our own little thing. I I'm, I'm up for it is what I'm trying to say. But to this larger question, I thought it was very, very fascinating, this idea of the relationship between trauma and, and creativity. I mean, what, what did you think? You've had a lot of trauma in your life and you are an enormously creative person. I mean, it. Is it true then? Is that truly what unlocks creativity is trauma? I have worked with many amazing artists that seemingly did not have much trauma as children. You know, I, I don't, Steve Carell, I still could get to know better, but he had loving parents and a warm family environment and went to a nice college and he is a genius. He is one of the greatest actors I've ever worked with. And he can bring any character to life. Uh, so, you know, the jury is out. But I know for me that if I had been raised with a perhaps a more loving, connected family and a little bit less poverty and maybe a little bit less uh, kind of physical fear uh, in my household, that perhaps I would have just been happy working in a shoe store as an adult and I wouldn't have needed to uh, pursue acting. I did really related, uh, you know, when David and I shared those stories about the girls, you know, he, 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 he drew art because it got him positive attention from females. And I went into acting because all of a sudden attractive young girls in high school noticed me because I was funny and I was entertaining in improvisations and in acting class. And so there is that kind of I don't know, that that missing gene perhaps in, in artists wanting to be noticed, loved, appreciated, and diving into our art uh, so that we ha actually have a sense of self-worth. I mean, we spoke about that whole phrase, I am enough, and how hard that mm. is. I mean, do you struggle with that, Reza, at all? Like, can you say, putting aside the books you're writing, the screenplays you're writing, the TV shows you're producing, the podcasts you're occasionally doing, um, uh, putting all that aside, can you say, you know, with um, a, a peaceful heart, I am enough? Ooh. Well, you know, again, as uh, as longtime listeners of the pod know, uh, I'm still dealing with Gabor Mate uh, dissecting dissecting you. me, making me realize that I am a serious workaholic. So I'm still dealing with that. So I got to be honest with you, enough isn't in my vocabulary. It just yeah. doesn't exist. Enough doesn't exist. But whatever, whatever success I have, whatever uh, goal I achieve, I don't. I don't even take the time to enjoy it because I'm already like next. Um, but maybe, and you, you know, you had trauma, yeah. right? So you're an immigrant family living in Oklahoma, yeah, living in a motel, uh -huh. yeah, um, in a culture that is like you better be successful at all costs for the pride of the family and the financial support of the family. Yeah. So perhaps that's what it is. Perhaps that trauma isn't so much about, oh, it makes you a great artist. It makes you feel like I am not enough unless I yeah. accomplish. Man, this is exactly the kind of question I want our audiences to respond to. What, what yeah. you guys out there, a lot of you are creatives. A lot of you are creatives in different ways, but you know, you use your brain and your imagination. A lot of you have a lot of drive. What I mean, what do you think? It, 
is trauma a sort of natural propulsion for these kinds of um, <clears throat> journeys that like, you know, people like Rain and I have, have gone on? Are you someone who has experienced trauma and then turned that trauma into success in your field? Uh, or are you like a uh, Steve Carell or like my wife, Jessica Jackley, you know, who had like had like the storybook childhood and is just as successful? <laughs> uh, let us know. And brilliant. And brilliant and beautiful. Yep. I don't know about Steve yep. Carell. My wife is beautiful. I don't know. Uh, he's a beautiful he man. He's kind of good looking. Yes. It's true. Milkshakers, as you know, uh, Rain and I always like to remind you that if you rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to find podcasts and you ask us a question uh, in the review section and we like your question, who knows? We may actually have you come on and ask the question uh, to us personally and we might even answer the question. No guarantees there. We may not answer the question. We may just tell you to fuck off. But at least you'll get to ask the question. And uh, this week, uh, we had a great question from a man named Casey from Casey. Casey from Casey. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Hey, um, Casey, uh, you're a big metaphysical milkshake fan. What's your favorite episode so far? Ben Fold's one that I just watched. Yeah, that Uh, was a a good one. The the reason I responded to your tweet a couple weeks ago asking for questions is because it was really like Rain Wilson and Ben Fold's colliding is like two parts of my uh you know pop culture, like just my world just <laughs> colliding so i i had to get in okay but somehow. here's here's the real question did you go and listen to uh lightning bugs ben folds podcast not yet so no, you got to do I that because that like the, if you I love will. the ben folds podcast that kind of mm-hmm. concludes it brings with it ben all folds around podcast yeah. and in that podcast yep. you get to hear ben folds and rain wilson do a, a piano bassoon duet. Come on, America. So, I mean, like, that, Come that's on. like, that's got to be your fantasy, right? I mean. Casey, what brings you here today? You've got a, you've got a question. You've got an issue. What do you, you want to talk about? You know, 200 years from now and beyond, what are the habits, activities, cultural norms that we all take part in? We can focus on USA. I mean, because uh, globally it would be different. But for us in the United States, uh, those activities and norms that are commonplace today that 200 years and beyond people will look back and um, in disgrace on us or they will strongly frown upon us. Oh, um, that's a fun question. You know, the, the obvious example, if you go to the extreme is slavery. Sure. Mm-hmm. Slavery, they didn't at the time. It's very true, Casey. We, we do frown upon slavery today. Well, there's a whole field of study of of, of futurology. I don't, I don't know what they, it has some fancy name. I forget what it That's is. Right. Where it's people will speculate on the future, and in, in fact, there's a whole, there's a. Uh, I wish I had this here. Maybe one of the producers can Google it for me. But there's a conference where every year people get together and they say, "Here's what's going to be happening in the coming years." But I love the idea that you're going 200 years into the future. Mm-hmm. Because it's kind of a specific number. It can, you know. No, but I like 200. Let's stick with 200 because, um, you know, it's kind of the, the founding of our of our country 200 years ago, 200 years from now. Um, it, it makes you think even bigger because, you know, we're always thinking 10 years, 20 years from now, what will it be like? 30, 40 years. So 200 years, I can think of a couple of things that are daily habits right now that will people 200 years from now will shake their head in disgust and sh- incredible chagrin about. One is driving your your uh, CO2 emitting, exhaust emitting car, carbon monoxide emitting car to a gas station and filling it with 20 to 30 gallons of petroleum fluid, which was, you know, cultivated from organic matter deep within, drilled from the earth and, um, and produced all this in the methane and the making of it. And then we're going to be driving that car with, with smoke coming out of our tailpipes and, you know, what is it? 200 million cars in the United States and all of that exhaust going up into the atmosphere. That is going to be just like, did did they understand what they were talking about? It's kind of like when we see Nowadays, we see trains that used to run on coal, you know, and 
people riding in the trains and like they're, they're covered in the soot from the coal blowing on them. It's kind of the same, like, wow, people used to get around like that. That's, that's crazy. Or maybe like those, the railroad cars where the two people would, would do the bar, you know, like in the silent movies and, and push the railroad car along. I think that's one. I think another one is going to be, um, partisan politics and campaigning. Um, when you tabulate the hundreds of millions of dollars every year that are spent on ads, large and small, it can be from a presidential ad that runs during the Olympics to like a state senator ad that just runs on local channels, the making of those ads, the, the, the print campaigns, the billboards, uh, the, the pop-up ads for, for, for campaigns, and this whole idea of like a, a two-party system kind of being interlocked um, in kind of right and wrong with that whole kind of corrupt moneyed system kind of promoting it. I think in the future, people will be like, what the hell were they thinking? All it created was just chaos and misery and, um, and uh, disunity. Um, so I think that's, that's another one on my, on my list. I mean, I think uh, morals and values obviously are going to change dramatically. You know, a hundred years ago, there was very little tolerance for um, homosexuality. Uh, interracial marriage was illegal. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> I think morality more and more will probably be disconnected from religion. I think religious identity is probably going to uh, shift. Uh, but I think if I were going to, if I were to sort of to give one prediction, like one kind of unusual prediction that I feel fairly confident about, but people probably aren't thinking about when they think about these things is I think that 200 years from now, there will be no such thing as the nation state anymore, which is a weird thing to say. Uh, because like Rain said, 200 years ago is kind of, you know, when America started. But I think that the concept of the nation, which is itself a very new idea, it's barely, it's just a little bit more than 200 years old, I think will cease to exist. And I think we will have um, reached a level of kind of post-nationalism where um, what you will have is a lot of confederations. In other words, most of the world will look like the European Union, right? A bunch of semi-independent states that are connected to each other by border and probably share like a single currency, a single economy. Uh, in the case of the European Union, a single birth certificate, you know, and maybe even a single parliament. Uh, I think like there won't be like the United States of America anymore. There'll be sort of like the North American Alliance you know, uh, the African, Central African Alliance, uh, Eastern European uh, Confederation. Um, and I think that's, that's probably how we will um, identify ourselves politically 200 years from now, that, the, that this hardcore concept of like nation and nationality will, will look back on it. Like the way that we look back today on like empires, like <laughs> those silly... That silly British empire, you know, so silly, those people. Uh, that's how we'll look at nationality and, 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 the, and the nation. Um, I think 200 years from now, English is going to be the universal language um, that everyone uh, around the globe is going to be raised speaking their national language or tribal language or, or, or state language or what have you. Although I agree with Reza that the idea of states is going to be very different 200 years from now. but they're also going to learn English because right now, when you think about it, English is the language of like international travel, um, medical science, um, and so many other uh, sciences. You need um, English to get by. And also, you know, culturally, English is very popular in terms of like rap music and movies and whatnot. And I think humanity will just decide that English is going to be kind of the universal language that everyone is going to speak. Now, I'm not saying this in a kind of like a colonizer kind of English superiority way. I just 
I kind of mm. see this happening already. There's more English speakers in China than there are in the United States. That's a fact. I think it'll it'll make uh, travel uh, so much better um, for for everyone because even if you grow up speaking English in you know Botswana and you want to travel to Singapore, everyone there will still be speaking English. So it will make it feel like we're all one species on a much, to a much greater degree. I mean, look, this is great news. On the one hand, there will be no such thing as America. On the other hand, all we lazy Americans won't have to pretend to try to learn other languages. So it's it's great for everyone. Casey, what do you, what about you? You've got to have some thoughts on this. Yeah. So the one example, if we go back to what will make us the villains in 200 years, and one that kind of thought of was we buy all these products that we don't no, we don't really think about how they got made, who made them, the conditions under which they were made. They obviously, they, clothing, tech products, won't name anything specific. But uh, I just wonder if in 200 years, we'll look back and say, can you, can you believe that almost literally everybody in the world perpetuated that uh, and, and bought these products while uh, you know, people were suffering in, in, in these sweatshops across the globe and things like that. That's kind of a dark thing to think about, but kind of an elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty that this kind of rampant consumerism in the West, where we just buy stuff with the click of a button when there's a couple billion people out there that can't really buy anything. So do you think we'll really be that kind of like spiritually mature in 200 years that, that there will be so much less of the haves and the have nots? That's the next thought. Do will these things get better? Will we realize, or is all of it just going to get worse? Uh, and I don't know if I have the answer to that. I would. I don't know. Two hundred years from now, uh, I, I just got back from a climate conference uh, sponsored by TED Talks, and um, two hundred years from now, we will have either just finished going through or be in the thick of a climate uh, crisis that is going to be have just world shaking ramifications in terms of species extinction, food chain issues, uh, um, uh, climate, uh, refugees. Um, so humanity is going to be severely tested, um, beyond, uh, we've beyond ways that we've ever been tested before. So hopefully we'll come out of that more mature and with greater, uh, compassion and um and a lot less uh tribalism and, and actually yeah. if you were looking for the reason why i live in kansas city that's it because i want to be as far away from the rising oceans well done yeah, well played yeah but you know what try the rocky mountains you'll be you'll be it's even better <laughs> casey thank you so much for coming on metaphysical milkshake and um this was a great question uh listeners we'd love to hear from you you know contact us on our social medias um at Rain Wilson, at Reza Aslan, at Metaphysical Milkshake on Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, what are your predictions, your little Nostradamus, uh, 200 years from now? And um, if you have your life's big question that's eating away at you, let us know, get in touch, and we would uh, love to bring you on the show. And I promise next week I will be part of the interview. Oh, thank you for deigning us with your presence, <laughs> Reza the Bully. See you next week, everyone. Metaphysical Milkshake is executive produced by Rain Wilson, Reza Aslan, and Colin Thompson. It's produced by Safa Samizadeh Yazd, Harris Lane, Mick Demaria, Hashem Self, and DJ Lubel. Cast Media is the production and distribution partner. It is edited by Tyler Newbold and audio mixed by Justin Kyle. Original music is composed by Jeff Tang. I actually really wish Reza was here so I could role play. He could play like the Reza that beat me up and then I could like beat him up in here. And, yeah. Uh, maybe it was good he didn't show up today. Or yeah. maybe I could beat him up through a Zoom, Zoom or whatever. Hey, thanks for watching, you guys. For more fantastic videos just like the one that you watch, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.